Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mojo Rising, how to make cancer suck less with Julie Stevens and Oscar Sierra. And for those of you who haven't listened to the earlier podcast, I just want to take a quick minute to introduce Oscar Sierra because he is the reason I am alive today. So Oscar Sierra was the first member I drafted to my Cancer Heal team, and he is an herbalist in the Atlanta area, but he's way more than an herbalist um, because his knowledge goes far beyond just the botanicals or nutraceuticals that can help support you. So Oscar, do you want to say anything before we dig in? And I'll share a little bit about my about our first meeting. Man, you heard I heard the intro and it just never gets old. Uh, every time you say it with that energy, it just is so, so Julie. And I, I don't, you claim that I'm the reason that you're alive, but I'm going to say that you're the reason I'm working so freaking hard on this Mojo Health Project because I see you put all this energy into it. And, and I'm like, I can do at least half of that. So, <laughs> you know, wow. uh, props to you. We're a hell of a power team. Let's just say that. Um, okay, so let me talk to you guys a little bit about my first visit with Oscar. And so let me just reset you. Of I just finished with surgery. Uh, my last day in the hospital, the oncologist that was assigned to me from my first health care system came and talked to me and said, Julie, it's pretty bad. Their path reports come back and it's spread. And in fact, we think it's actually spread not locally and actually further into your neck and other places that are inoperable. And so we think the right course of action is six months of chemotherapy. And then we'll do a PET scan at the end of six months. And that sounds pretty logical to most people, but I'm a data G. And so my question was, how can I measure incremental change? Um, how can I measure if the chemo treatments are working? And I want to remind you, I didn't actually have any idea that chemo resistance was actually a thing. I didn't know that that was a term that was possible. I thought chemo just worked for cancer. Um, so it wasn't that I thought I could diagnose I was chemo resistant. It was because, frankly, I knew that I could withstand whatever headwinds chemo brought towards me from a side effect perspective if I knew I was winning the battle. So in my first visit with Oscar, he sat me down and said, why are you here? And I said, because I want to understand how to measure incremental data. And then he upped my ante and said, well, I'm going to teach you how to prepare your body so that you won't have side effects. But even more than that, I'm going to teach you how to understand your cancer, where your doctor's going to look at it like it's male or female, like you have stage four colon cancer. But I'm, but I'm going to teach you if this colon cancer is wearing Reeboks, is left or right handed, if they have blue eyes um, and where they came from. So you wanted to give me a whole lot more information than what my oncologist was actually thinking about. And that power, that knowledge is what actually ended up fueling the power and how I was able to fail fast and pivot in my chemotherapy expensive, you know, ke chemotherapy um, experience. So um, if I would have followed what the first doctor had suggested, I would have had six months of poison followed by a test to show it had been ineffective, the cancer had grown in all the spots around my body that were inoperable, and the chances of us ever catching this are frankly pretty small. So we know that this data and having this early on helped me understand how I could drive my journey differently. It is truly what gave me power and knowledge as power. So many of you guys have heard about personalized medicine or targeted cancer treatment, and the way they do this is through genomic testing. So let me take a quick stop and ask you, Oscar, what is a genomic testing and how is it different from genetic testing? Okay, so I always, you know, I always like to divide stuff into yin and yang, you know, two things. So if you kind of take the whole situation and you divide that into two, so one side is the person, the other side is the pathology, be it, you know, uh, a triple negative breast cancer or a colorectal cancer. Uh, the geography tells us some information, but frankly, the tell what tells us more other than where it's located, you know, breast, lung, prostate, whatever, is what are the characteristics of that cancer? Just like a person could be located in Cleveland and a person could be located in Dominican Republic or a person can be you know, located in Atlanta, but the, two, the one guy in, in Atlanta and the lady in Dominican Republic could be more similar for these reasons than the person in Cleveland and the person in California. So, you know, telling us ge geography matters, but it's not the end all be all. So the whole situation divided into is, the person and the pathology, you know, Chinese medicine thousands of years ago looked at the pathology, you know, instead of just saying arthritis, my joint hurts, it said, okay, well, 
Is it the hot type, the cold type of arthritis? Is it the damp type or is it the cold damp or the hot damp or whatever? So it really honed in on more specifics about a pathology, right? Something that shouldn't be there. So this is kind of zooming out just the, the basic gist of what we're talking about. And, and we're talking specifically about genomics. And how is that different than genetics is that we're looking at the fingerprint, the genomic fingerprint of the cancer rather than the person. So the, the person may have been born with blue eyes and, you know, blonde hair and, you know, right handed. But the cancer, remember, is, is distinctly different genetics it's similar it's very similar but there's a couple things that are odd and peculiar about it so it you know 10 different cancers located in the breast could have 10 totally different fingerprints just like 10 different people in cleveland ohio could have 10 totally different predilections for what they like in their oatmeal or you know what their shoe size is or you know whether they like basketball baseball or you know muffins so you know, people are different. Cancers are different. Cancers, therefore, should be treated differently and people should be treated differently. So, you know, we're not going to talk about how we tailor and individualize treatments according to person. For the purposes of just keeping this short, we're honing in on, you know, what is cancer pathology genomics? And this is, this is assessed not via blood work so much, although kind of there are some ways to do that, but this is assessed typically via biopsy, whereas they take a sample of that tumor, and this is for solid tumors. So like leukemias and lymphomas kind of have their own uh, uh, fingerprints as well, but you don't really biopsy uh, those. I mean, you can biopsy no, but anyway, for the purposes of solid tumors, you biopsy them and then look at them with the genomic microscope and see if they're wearing Nikes or Reeboks, they have brown eyes or blue eyes, they have a Yankees hat or a Braves hat on because sometimes it matters how they respond to treatment. And as you alluded to, some of these things are resistant to certain treatments, but they're sensitive to others. Sensitive means that they, they respond well. And by respond well, we typically mean shrinkage, although asterisk, let's not get overly focused on shrinkage because you could do a really good job shrinking a tumor and also kill the patient at the same time. Or you could do uh, not a good job of tricking the tumor, but just stopping it and increasing the health of the patient. The patient lives a really long time with a tumor that isn't necessarily growing. It's just sitting there doing nothing, but overall the, the scenario looks better. But again, we're honing in on the genomics and these are, you know, I'll give you some examples rather than saying Nikes or Reebok. So for example, as you know, KRAS is a mutation that can pop up. Uh, there are other ones, P53 mutations, uh, PI3K mutations, mTOR mutations, there, there, there are different ways that we can assess, you know, Yankees or Braves, you know, right-handed or left-handed, brown eyes or blue eyes. And there are certain treatments. And again, within the six toolboxes, there are certain uh, pharmaceuticals, there's botanicals, there's nutraceuticals, there's diet. You know, for example, olives are uh, something that targets HER2 new mutations. Uh, but, you know, it's not a drug. It's not necessarily a supplement. It's not a lifestyle. It's a food. So, you know, eating olives can actually impact your cancer if your cancer happens to be HER2 positive because it lowers uh, this HER2. And, and I can talk more about pathways, but I don't want to dominate this conversation. Okay. So I'm just going to recap what you just said and say genomic testing is a way to identify the unique characteristics of your tumor and predict how the cancer and your body will behave. So I think that's kind of what this is. Now, let's talk a little bit about how long has this been in existence? Because um, not all doctors are using this as an entry point when you get diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, so I can zoom out and maybe they weren't being called genomic testing thousands of years ago because, you know, the concept of DNA and RNA and uh, looking at at that from a very small perspective, you know, using the tools to find those things didn't exist until relatively recently, right? You know, the 50s, you know, concept of DNA. But I would say that, you know, traditional medicine, Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine did differentiate pathology, like I said, more specifically into what they called, you know, wind or heat or damp or cold or whatever. And they treated, you know, 10 different people with arthritis, potentially 10 different ways based upon 
how their pathology was different. So the concept of, has been there forever. In oncology, it really hasn't been, it still isn't really standard practice, frankly. I mean, I still encounter patients that don't get any genetic testing at all, and they just kind of get the same treatment that everyone else gets, you know, and it always reminds me of like a, you know, a cow just kind of, you know, treating, treating someone like a farm animal, like every, you know, all the cows are going in the same direction. Um, for sure. And when you, when I looked at the research after you shared with me that this was so important, I looked back and saw that it actually had its roots in the genomic and the genetic genomic testing had its roots in the genome project that started in 2003. But really this was approved for use for medical for cancer in December of 2017. So it's still relatively new in the world of cancer when you think about um, our, the taxonomy that doctors use was invented in the 1940s of location and stage. So it's still relatively new compared to the 1940s. But in the last you know six or seven years, I would hope that this had become commonplace. And in fact, when you in our first meeting told me how important this data was, I had to call my first oncologist no fewer than 20 times to get them to order this test. I called every day. I followed up with an email. At one point they got so annoyed, they said that the path department at my hospital had lost my tumor. So I started calling the path department at my hospital every day. Like I had to advocate for myself in such a wild way to get this data. But when you explained how important it was, that was the best use of time I put forward in trying to, to really help me um, figure out how to heal this cancer. Because by having this data, before I walked in for my first day of chemo and I got this test result at 5 p.m. the day before I started chemo, we knew right away that it was not likely that chemo would work for me. So it has not been around a ton of times and it's absolutely worth your energy to advocate for yourself to get this data. But let's talk a little bit about how it gets ordered. So I had to order it through my oncologist, but would anyone else possibly order this, Oscar? Or is this traditionally just your oncologist you'd ask for this test from? Yeah, traditionally, I mean, it should be the oncologist that wants to know this. It is the oncologist that has the ability to order this. But frankly, any doctor, uh, a physician that could be a DO or an MD could order it. So theoretically, your gynecologist, your podiatrist, your dermatologist could order a pathology report that's more advanced, that doesn't just tell us the location. It tells us that this person in Cleveland is wearing Reeboks, not Nikes, and the Yankees hat, not a Braves hat. And, it, and those details, as you said, can really make a difference with treatment. And uh, people don't want to be doing chemo for fun. And the fact that you have to call 20 times is 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 awful. And it's a testament to Julie Stevens. And how many people on a good day without cancer would have the tenacity to call 20 times for something, let alone you're diagnosed with cancer. You know, it's you and your dog there at your house. You don't, yeah, at this point, you don't have a whole 10 person team of professionals that are supporting you, right? You just decide, you just set your mind to something, you freaking do it. So, you know, kudos to you. And this is why one of the many things that makes you a badass. And also, I completely understand when cancer patients have been through the ringer already of chemo, radiation, surgery, the shock of getting diagnosed, their family telling them one thing, they're thinking another, their daughter and uncle are saying something different. You know, they're going through divorce. Who knows what else they're going through in their life? Who would have the tenacity and and just energy to the follow up for the, and, and fear? You know, I don't want to get in an argument with my oncologist. They said they don't usually do this. I don't want to get in a you know bad relationship with the doctor. I'm putting my life in their hands. Let's just not stir the pot or rock the boat. But uh, but no, uh, enter Julie Stevens. Well, I am a data G. And if you tell me that data is going to help me change the outcomes, and let's be real, I had a 14% chance of living, I'm willing to do whatever it took to get the right data so that we could figure out how we could change my odds. And as you mentioned, my advantage was I was alone. I didn't have to hold up or worry about how this was impacting my partner or my children because I could navigate this game independently. And that's why I'm trying to use the time that I was able to invest in my own health. And I didn't have to worry about making sure it felt normal for anyone else in my household. I could spend the time calling 20 times, cry myself to sleep and wake up and do it all again the next day without it impacting anyone else. And I think that's really the gift that I was given that I'm trying to give to everyone else through Mojo Health. But one of the things you cautioned me in that first day is, listen, we don't just want genomic testing done. We want it done 
in these ways. And you actually gave me a couple of brands or companies that were better at this than others. So can you tell a little bit to our listeners, who are some of the reputable companies that they should be specifically asking their doctor for? Okay. And disclosure, I have no agreement with these companies or getting any kind of kickback or, I mean, I don't personally order these tests. Uh, I, I just like them. I find them useful. And also a caveat here, or the first one is a disclosure. The second one is a caveat. There is no perfect test. There is no perfect blood work. I have seen labs make errors firsthand. They just messed up. It wasn't the person's fault. It wasn't the clinician's fault. Someone just put the wrong tube in the wrong thing. And they spun it the wrong way. And the lab got a bogus number because we did a follow-up test and it was a totally different number on the same day. So, you know, more data, more better, right? Um, Neogenomics is one company that I find to be both accurate clinically as well as, you know, pretty good um, uh, turnaround time and good data. Keras is another one. We used to use Keras a whole lot more. They, they actually, they and Neogenomics both took a couple markers off their panels. I think it's be, largely because doctors would see these, you know, oh, okay, it's wearing a Nike uh, hat. Uh, what do I do with that? I have no idea. So why even test for that? So they, they sort of taken some of these things off and it's unfortunate because sometimes, despite the fact that there may not be pharmaceutical interventions for that particular result, you know, to see if it's Nikes or Reeboks, uh, there may be botanical and nutraceutical diet lifestyle, or maybe none of those today, but maybe some grad student in a year from now at the University of wherever, Duke or whatever, stumbles upon the fact that this gene mutation associated with um, you know breast cancer uh, predicts that the apple cider vinegar responds really well, or uh, drug X or drug Z or lifestyle, you know, W. Um, so... And then you can look back on that and say, well, did someone test for that? Because I happen to be a big fan of lifestyle W yoga or breath work or drug X uh, we accidentally found happens to really target this gene mutation. So it may not be useful today, but I think more data, more better. So long as you don't come to, you know, come to it with fear, you come to it with curiosity and uh, a sense of awe and understanding and know that the science is evolving and that we're trying to figure this out, but but I'd rather have the data than not have it. So Keras and Neogenomics are probably my favorite with Neogenomics being, I think the best. There are ways to get uh, a blood kind of, it's called a liquid biopsy. So, you know, like Garden360 uh, and some other companies are kind of coming out with some stuff. Uh, Signatera, a Natera company, I think is pretty good as well. They do both the circulating tumor cell and the fingerprint genomics. Um, I think that's a pretty good company as well. We have also seen uh, split samples. So they send the biopsy to Neogenomics and they send the biopsy to somewhere else and they don't match, which means that someone someone's wrong. And so, you know, we frequently see this when we, when we send uh, to two different companies, they're sometimes not exactly the same, but you know, the, the one that responds is the one that's right, right? So if, if one gave you a, a PI3K mutation and you give the interventions for PI3K and the tumor shrinks, it means that the company that identified the PI3K mutation was correct. So anyway, that's that's the short story on that. You know, and, and the interesting part is it's it's not just one thing they're testing. So when I look at my results and I think I think about the day we went through my results, you actually went through and you're like, hey, we could actually target cancer this way. And you're, you are HER2 positive. So start taking olives and your MSI high. So immunotherapy is an option. But because you're KRAS G13D, I saw this research from lung cancer around KRAS that showed that uh, platinum based chemotherapies are less likely to work. So you broke apart this this data and saw multiple pieces and multiple paths for how we could attack the cancer in a different way. And that's the thing that this data gives you is hope and options. So that's where I would say is until you have all this data, nothing is written in, 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 in permanent marker, gather this data. And from there, we can begin to understand if there are any other options that you can use to treat that cancer and or to heal the host. So I think that the truth of the matter is, is there's lots of different ways to attack this. So um, why do you think this was so hard? Why do you think I had to work so hard to have this done? And I think back to my second hospital system that I went to, 
And if you look on their website, all over the website, it talks about precision medicine and it talks about all the ways that they're going to really focus this on you and targeted therapies. And yet it was kind of still the same when I went to see that oncologist and go through the process, they still wanted me to do the six months of chemotherapy and then they would test at the end, but they were very game for measuring the incremental change. So why do you think this is the, the case today? There's no good reason. I can only think of um, lame excuses uh, that they weren't trained in this. So, you know, again, this is fairly new stuff. And the doctors went to med school, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So they weren't trained on this stuff. And that's one. And it's a poor excuse because, you know, that's what CEUs are for. That's what knowledge is for, is to actually create change and change of practice, not just, oh, you know, I know that the world is round. Well, what are you going to do with that? You have to do something with that information, put it into practice because people are dying, frankly. So I don't have any great answers for why this is not more prevalent other than just um, ignorance, frankly. And um, I mean, these these companies are CLIA certified. It's not like they're some company out of Abu Dhabi. You know, these are American companies that have been well validated. The research is there. We know the world is round. Uh, we have data on it. You know, like we used to have an excuse when we had to mail a letter across the ocean to inform the queen that the world is round. And, you know, we found America, not India or, you know, but like these days, the Internet has happened. You don't have an excuse, really. So I, I don't have any good excuses. You might you might know as to why it's not more prevalent. I, I don't know other than than they're ignorant. I have a hypothesis and it's it's based in fear. Doctors don't know what it means to be certain things, and they don't have the mapping if you're G12D versus G13 versus this. But until we start to collect this data on every single patient and understand what treatments work, we will continue to be living in fear. So in my, my hypothesis is once we begin to get this data on every single patient, we'll begin to understand what treatment options are available if there'll be clinical trials, they'd be a, a fit for, um, what sorts of facilities will be the best places for them, what sorts of doctors they need to draft to their team. And ultimately, this is what's going to reduce the healthcare disparities we see, depending on what region you live in, or what economic um, opportunities you may have, or be able to spend in your care. This is going to be the great equalizer between patients. So what happens if you don't have that? Like, can you think of any examples, Oscar, of like, we didn't have this and here's what happened until we had this data or anything like that that you would share with our listeners? Well, what happens if you don't have this data, you're going to be treated just like everyone else is, the standard of care, which is awful. I mean, the standard of care sometimes works and it sometimes doesn't. And let's define work, you know, tumor shrinkage. In my opinion, work should be quality of life and overall survival. But let's just use kind of the works as in tumor shrinks, Right. Um, the tumor doesn't shrink. That's what happens. And you undergo chemo for fun is what I call it because it didn't do anything. Whatever drug didn't actually hurt the cancer. It just hurt the person. And, and they did it for six months and they drove, they took time out of their day and schedule to go pay for treatment that was not only not efficacious, but was toxic. So, I, I mean... If it was at least efficacious and toxic, that would be one thing. So that's what happens is it's a complete waste of time. And time is precious because sometimes when things get way too advanced, it you know, even if you dial in the right medication, because the body, the immune system, the vitality is so depleted from the conventional therapy and or the cancer itself, it's just too late. That's the perfect example. And I, I'm thinking about, um, you know, for anyone who knows Oscar and I, you know, our shared passion outside of health and changing the world is in music. And so a very famous musician had been diagnosed with colon cancer a few months ago, and we had the opportunity to connect with his wife on the phone and see if there's anything from my story that we could offer to help change the outcome of his. And what we learned is he had the same genomic tumor I had. Um, he had been put through exactly what the doctors recommended for me. Six months of a pretty harsh chemo. It didn't work. They put him into a year of an even harder chemo. It certainly didn't work because he was KRAS positive, which means the chemotherapies they were putting against his body were never going to work, but they didn't get that data up front. And in fact, they put all sorts of toxic chemicals, chemo for fun into his body. And as a result, he did not make it. He He passed away a few weeks ago. And when we had the opportunity to speak with his wife on the phone, it broke my heart realizing it was a lack of data 
that poisoned his body and forced that chemo for fun. And that is something that no cancer patient should have to go through. So we're both of us are very passionate about using data to drive your strategy. And it's so that you don't have to torture yourself and go through these barbaric treatments for no outcome that really serves you. So um, it, it, this is real. And it is what I would say, me being able to be, be so data confident that I could advocate for myself, as well as me being able to really um, pivot when we knew that something wasn't working, all came from having this sort of information to, and to use that in, in our, our strategy. And the only reason I asked for this is because of you, Oscar. So to come full circle to the beginning of our conversation where I said, you saved my life and you said, no, I saved my life. I would go back and say, you dropped the knowledge bomb on me that let me know what I needed to collect from a data perspective so that I could begin to advocate and navigate the system in a way that served my end purposes. And I really loved what you just shared there for a minute, which is the goal of the game is not to get rid of cancer cells. The goal of the game is to have a long, healthy life long after you've healed from cancer. And so we've got to change the goalpost to what really we're going towards because just killing cancer cells, but ruining other parts of your body doesn't actually serve the long term of who you are. All right, we, we need to wrap this up. So Oscar, what would you add to this, this, this session? What, what else would do our listeners need to know about genomic testing or being a better data G? Yeah, this is one way that I explain to my patients because although I see patients in different countries and different parts of the US, most of them are still in Georgia and we're here in Atlanta and Atlanta is famous for a couple things and uh, the Braves are one of them, the traffic is another one. So when we were uh, gonna have a soccer team, you know, before the Atlanta United uh, came out, I actually proposed the, the name of the soccer team should be the Atlanta traffic. Uh, just, I uh, thought it was funny, but anyway. Um, so everyone is familiar with, we have 285, which is a perimeter. And we have 400 kind of going up and down and 75 coming in from like Tennessee and Chattanooga, you know, from the West and 85 going over to South Carolina from the East and 20 kind of running down the Middle East and West. So um, cancer pathways are kind of like, this is kind of how we explain it. So suppose um, someone has a, a PI3K mutation. What, what does that mean? It means that that cancer really likes taking 400 to get to Atlanta. And so the waste goes out of Atlanta using 400 and the food and energy come into to the cancer path, the cancer cell using this pathway to the nucleus of the cell. So if you know this information, then you could put roadblocks or you could completely blow up Georgia 400 going, you know, to and from Atlanta. And, you know, Atlanta would have a really hard time functioning. You know, this is this harkens back to the blockade, which is a, a sore spot for still a lot of Southerners. But, um, you know, so but if another cancer could, you know, love 85 and they love sending traffic up and down and resources up and down, you know, 85 or some is 75. So, you know, they're kind of just the, the chemotherapy doesn't particularly target any roadway it just is kind of like a nuclear bomb and it hits a little bit of everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The targeted therapies target 400, they target 285, they target 85. And if you know which road is preferred, and if you, what the herbs do is they put a whole lot of speed bumps there. They don't totally block it because some of these pathways, the good cells also use. So you don't want to necessarily completely shut off a pathway necessary. Sometimes you do, but you know, you got to be careful with that because it harms the good cells too. So if you know which roadways are being really used, you can know how to intervene in a more targeted fashion. And that's how I explain the genomic significance and how we can use that later to leverage pharmaceutical, botanical, nutraceutical diet and lifestyle options to put speed bumps or road closures on certain you know, highways and roadways along the uh, Georgia pathways, if that helps at all. It sure does. And I think that is just one more reminder, guys, of why we are trying to help you become a better data G. As you likely know, there are a suite of resources on mojohealth.org under the patient resource tab and a be a data G tab. I would encourage, it'll be linked in, in the, underneath the podcast. We'll have those links everywhere we can. We'll share them on social media as well. But that website is going to have a wealth of information for you on how you can measure different parts of your blood biomarkers, 
how you can measure your body biomarkers, how you can measure the cancer markers, like the genomic testing we've discussed today. So that be a data G tag is going to have a whole bunch of information to help you have the most successful and enjoyable cancer experience possible. So for all of our listeners, I just want to say thank you so much for spending some time with Oscar and I today. Um, you understand how I'm alive today by accruing and by building and, and curating the team of the best practitioners in all these different areas. And having Oscar as my herbalist was truly the difference maker in my story. So once again, Oscar, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all you have done for me to teach me and advocate and to be my partner on this journey. Um, I know I'm alive because of you. Um, and I know that the, the power of the two of us together are going to be what helps many, many other people have a much better cancer experience. So thank you to all for, for joining us. And we're just so grateful for you. See you guys. Take care.